As one of the richest poors, Henry built a mansion featured by nearly every architectural publication of the time. Hi everyone, Ken here. Welcome to this house. In 1844, Henry Poor was born to a well-to-do family in Bangor, Maine. His father, Henry Sr., had started off his career as a lawyer, but quickly changed tide to capitalize on the emerging timber industry. He took a gamble, investing all of his money into timber, and with a little bit of luck and a lot of binding contracts, he was able to take control of the timber industry in Maine, becoming one of the state's wealthiest residents in just a few short years. Feeling like fate was on his side, he further invested the lion's share of his wealth into building railroads. Once again, he saw his fortune grow exponentially, becoming one of the wealthiest men not only in Maine, but in the U.S. Around this time, in the 1860s, his son Henry Jr. graduated from Harvard. The father and son duo collaborated to create a new business, known as the H.V. and H.W. Poor Company, which quickly evolved into Standard & Poor's, known more commonly as the S&P. They published financial research and analyzed stocks, becoming an invaluable asset for investors and stock traders alike in the railroad industry. Their financial analyses were so heavily relied on that they had no other option than to expand into all facets of industry. Over the next few decades, what we now know as the S&P became the leading authority on credit rating and financial research. This, of course, made both men even wealthier than they already were. Henry Poor Jr. hired architect Stanford White to design for him a stately and imposing mansion in Manhattan. Then he sought to build a refined country estate in Tuxedo Park, New York. He hired architect Henry Randall to design for him a sprawling mansion based on Jacobian design. Upon its completion in 1899, word began to travel about his exquisite estate and various publications were invited out to the property to photograph it. Not only was the red brick mansion a sight to behold, but the grounds which surrounded it were shaped to provide a perfectly balanced context to frame the house. Long runs of balustrade were planned to reach towards the horizon creating a staggered series of terraces from which to not only enjoy the view shed, but to frame formal gardens with sightlines terminating on fountains and statues. To enter the mansion, we will find the front door below a heavily embellished limestone archway. This brings us to the hall, stretching nearly from side to side in the mansion, where we will find each of the public rooms branching off from its many openings. Let's first venture into the drawing room, and though the space is dominated by a floor-to-ceiling stone fireplace, let's not forget to admire the craftsmanship of the doorways and the coffered ceiling. Next, we can make our way into the dining room, clad in rich oak paneling softly illuminated by sconce lights in the absence of a chandelier. Behind us, the fireplace is decorated with intricate stone relief work. As we continue exploring this grand estate, we find the library enveloped by built-in bookcases, and then set within the fireplace's upper mantle, niches were designed to display a collection of Henry's most prized porcelains. While the entire estate was planned for entertaining, the smoking room is where Henry preferred to host only his closest friends. Here he could show off trophies from his hunts and photos from his travels and catch up with friends long into the night. As the sun begins to set, we will make our way back into the hall and begin searching for the bedrooms. Off to the side, beyond an intricately carved arcade, we find the grand staircase welcoming us to the second floor. As we reach the landing, we pause to admire the sheer artisanry boasted by every surface, from delicate wood carvings to graceful plaster work, the attention to detail is exquisite. Staying over, we will be shown the many guest rooms. While no two rooms are even close to being identical, they each share heavy wooden furniture paired with subdued colors in their textiles. Even Henry's room follows this general rule of design, though it is much larger than the rest. With sweeping views overlooking the viewshed through its bay window and a private veranda to enjoy still nights with fresh air. Henry Poor enjoyed summering at Woodland for nearly a decade before he lived up to his own name. During the Panic of 1907, stock prices fell more than 50%, causing fortunes to be wiped out overnight. Henry had most of his money invested and lost most of it as well. He could no longer afford to hold onto both his Manhattan mansion and Woodland. For his house in Manhattan, I'll link a video at the end of this one, but as for Woodland, he held on for as long as he could in the hopes that the market would turn around and he could recoup his losses. But by mid-1908, things were looking grim. He sold the estate at a heavy discount just to unload it. It was originally purchased by priests for use as a monastery before it was transformed into a school. More recently, however, Woodland has been revitalized as a private residence, and though many changes were made over the years, a substantial portion of its original interiors remain intact and restored. Did you have a favorite room or architectural feature? Let me know down below in the comment section. I'd also like to take a moment to say a huge thank you to our This House supporters. 
If you would like to see your name on the screen and show your support for the production of these videos, join our membership program today. As always, make sure to hit that subscribe button so you never miss an exciting episode of This House.